place for women. Violence, rape, mutilation, harassment, discrimination. In every corner of our planet, entrenched patriarchal systems subjugate women. And in these same corners of the universe, we're all digesting the same stories, the same images, stereotypes created from a male perspective. I'm not suggesting that misogyny was invented in Hollywood, but for a hundred years, movies have glorified gender stereotypes that sexualize women and diminish our role in the world, stereotypes created from a male perspective. I'm a screenwriter and a director who works in Hollywood, and I know that when more women are the storytellers creating points of view that elevate women, the world has a chance of being a better place. The trouble is, Hollywood has a woman problem of its own. I was a professional child actor. I spent several years in front of the camera making commercials and television series. I was the voice of Lucy in Peanuts. I sang jingles with Louis Armstrong. I knew my lines, I hit my marks, I found my key light, and I earned enough residuals to help pay my way through graduate school. Here's a print ad I did when I was a kid. I'm the one blowing out the candles. And there's the copy line, moments like this won't wait for dad with mom picking up a camera. So easy to use that even a woman could do it. <laughs> Brainwashing, right? Perpetuating messages loud and clear that women aren't capable, women aren't strong, women don't take agency in our own lives. So by the time I was a teenager, I knew I wanted to be on the other side of the camera. So I studied writing and literature at Sarah Lawrence, and I studied graphics and photography at Parsons School of Design, and I went to film school. In 1979, at my NYU graduate film program, it was filled with women. And aside from the fact that our cinematography teacher truly would not let the girls load the cameras with film, I kid you not, he must have seen the ad. <laughs> Um, we were optimistic. My graduate thesis film won dozens of awards, landing me prestigious grants that enabled me to continue making short films. I sold to PBS and HBO. And during that time, I worked as a storyboard artist on big budget studio movies for well-known directors. And I began writing my first screenplays and optioning them. I was hopeful. I felt like I was on the right track. So I moved to Los Angeles. So I figured if I want to make movies, I should be in the town where movies are made. But it was nothing but rejection for years on end. Slammed doors. No access, no matter how hard I tried. And I tried. It felt like being locked outside of the gates of a kingdom. Understandably, around that time, I started to think, OK, there's something wrong with me. I guess I'm not good at this. But it was also around that time that social scientists began publishing statistics revealing that only 1% of the movies we saw in theaters were in fact directed by women. And as you can see, 30 years later, that statistic improved by only 1%. I mean, the numbers were horrifying, but they were clarifying. And instead of being defeated, I felt emboldened to be try to I felt emboldened to try to be part of the solution to try to fix the problem. There weren't many women directing in the 80s, 90s and aughts. The studios and the networks, they had so many terrible excuses. They would say things like, "Oh, we had a woman last season and she didn't work out very well." Can you imagine saying that to a man? Or they would say, the talent, the actors, the producers, the writers, you know, fill in the blanks. They don't like working with women directors. Or the most, the most egregious one was, we can't find any women directors. When there were already hundreds of professional, experienced directors in the Directors Guild, and all these people really needed to do was make a phone call and have the will to want to change the status quo. It took a decade for me to get my first job. It was Doogie Howser, MD, 
And Stephen Bochco was the producer, and he was really one of the few in Hollywood who genuinely cared about diversity. And over time, I built a solid resume directing cop shows, medical shows, family dramas. I got to work with amazing actors, incredible technicians, in wonderful producers, and I made a good living, and I practiced my craft, and I'm proud of that work, and I'm so grateful for it. But even during those busy years, each job was as difficult to get as the first. And without top agents, who had no interest at the time in representing diversity talent, there were many years that went by when I didn't work at all. And that was a hardship on my family. When I was working, I was able to make on-screen choices that helped to send messages out into the world. For instance, I would cast women as judges and lawyers, roles that traditionally went to men. Or I would stage argument scenes that didn't revert to violence. Or I insisted that appropriate hair and makeup and wardrobe for girls made them look like kids and not mini women. I also advocated for women behind the camera. I wrote articles in the trades at a time when it was considered controversial. And I spoke up when I was speaking on panels or when I was interviewed in documentaries. And I ran, I was, and I was co-chair of the Women's Steering Committee of the Directors Guild of America, where in 2013, my committee and I together created a summit celebrating women directors. And this was the first event of its kind in the 90-year history of the Directors Guild. And despite so many women activists pushing for change, pushing for awareness for decades, it honestly was not until just a handful of years ago, triggered by Me Too and Time's Up, when things began to change in earnest. And things are better now. The statistics have improved. More than 30% of the television that you see now is directed by women. But in feature films, we are still stuck at 9%, even when Greta Gerwig delivers a billion-dollar box office movie, and directors like Jane Campion and Catherine Bigelow and Chloe Zhao have won Academy Awards. Why is this important? Because movies influence culture all over the world. And women have different stories to tell. And we tell them differently. From Asia to Africa, from Albany to Anchorage, in every town and village where there's a cinema and there's a TV set, it's important that the world see women as equals, at the center of our stories, as makers and doers and leaders, and not just as wives and girlfriends and sex objects. In 1985, Alison Bechtel, a well-known cartoonist, was sick and tired of seeing movie after movie where the female character existed only to serve the man's story. So she came up with something called the Bechtel test. And all a movie needed to do to pass the test was to have two women characters talk to one another about anything other than a man. That's it. That's all they needed to do. Two women talk to each other about anything other than a man. And believe it or not, most movies failed miserably and still do. And in fact, to this day, most women characters don't have a name. And yet there's a very good chance they'll soon be taking off their clothes. In 2008, while watching the Democratic National Convention, I saw Lily Ledbetter speak for the first time on television, an Alabama tire factory supervisor. She worked for 20 years in a psychologically toxic environment, only to discover that she was being paid 40% less than men with the same job only because she was a woman. Devastated, she slogged through an arduous 10-year legal battle culminating in a landmark dissent written by Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And eventually, President Obama signed 
the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Restoration Act of 2009 as his first piece of legislation. I tracked her down. I called her the very next day and I said, Lily, your story is going to make a great movie like Norma Ray or Erin Brockovich. And you know what she said to me? She said, I think so too. <laughs> and while it has taken me 10 years of my own long journey, along with a remarkable team of magnificent, like-minded women, one of whom is sitting with me today, um, I just completed directing my first feature film, entitled Lily, starring the glorious, magnificent, award-winning actor Patricia Clarkson playing Lily Ledbetter. In a world where only 7% of the lead characters that you see on screen are women over 50, we made a movie about a woman in her 60s starring a woman in her 60s, directed by a woman in her 60s, produced by women in their 50s and 60s, financed primarily by mature women, and where our music and our post-production teams were 99% women. <laughs> Lily's story is one of tenacity and courage. She was cheated, she was mistreated, she was underestimated for 20 years. And though she never saw any financial remuneration, she says that her reward was that she made a difference. When the movie Lily will be released, it will be accompanied by a social impact campaign, collaborating with organizations all across the country and while making this movie has certainly been a life's goal for me, most importantly, it's a movie that will be sending out messages everywhere about gender equity and the belief that every single one of us can make a difference. I've been a professional director now for nearly 40 years. And it is beautiful to witness the changes for women behind the camera in my industry our pipelines are filled with gloriously talented, remarkable women who are getting chances and who are making their own chances. But there are many more women, particularly women of color, who desperately need an opportunity, a way in. The numbers are still unacceptable. And so is how women around the world and in our own country continue to be oppressed. In our country, we still don't have a constitutional amendment guaranteeing women equal rights. And the right to make choices about our own body is taken away from our government. And no wonder. As we are witnessing right now with the strikes, Hollywood needs to be restructured. We need to fling open the doors to women to writers, directors, producers, cinematographers, production designers, composers, filling the screen with sisters and daughters, mothers, grandmothers, heroes, anti-heroes, and villains, celebrating the diversity, the complexity, and the value of womankind. You have some power in this. The next time you go buy a movie ticket, consider whether a woman wrote it or directed it. And when a woman-directed movie is opening in a theater near you, try to ensure that that first opening weekend is sold out. It's so important. We can't wait for Hollywood to do the right thing. But if they feel it in their wallets, we might have a chance. Humanity will thank you, and so do I. Thank you.